Before we start, I would like the, the panels to, to quickly introduce themselves and explain a bit about their, their company. So maybe, Tony, we could uh, s start with you. Tony, just a quick intro of yourself and, and the company you represent, please. Yeah. So. My name is Tony Lauritsen, I'm the CEO of uh, the Dynagas Energy Partners and uh, we together with our uh, um, uh, parent company has a fleet of uh, 17 LNG carriers um, where most of them are tied up on long-term charters. Thank you, Paul. Yes, uh, good morning everybody, my name is Paul Wogan, I'm the CEO of Gaslog. Uh, Gaslog has uh, two companies, parent company and an MLP, and the combined fleet with new buildings is uh, 31 vessels. Uh, hello everybody, my name is Stavros Hazegrigoris, I'm the managing director of Marangas Maritime. We are operating a fleet of uh, 26. LNG carrier, most of them uh, long-term charter, and then we have an order book of uh, eight uh, LNG carriers and one FSRU. Good morning, I'm Harry Vafias, the founder and CEO of Steltgas. We, we run a fleet of uh, 55 ships, mostly LPG ships, uh, all on uh, short and medium uh, time charters. Yeah, hi, good morning. I'm Christos Ekonomou. I'm the founder and CEO of Oceanus, which is a spot LNG player, and also uh, CEO of LNG Ships, which is a term um, LNG player. Both companies own five vessels, so that's a total of ten. Perfect. Thank you, guys. So with four of the five panelists being in an LNG, I think we'll, we'll start there. So, you know, the, the fundamentals for LNG, as, as you're probably all aware, looks, uh, looks quite appealing. You have a supply growth of more than 130 million tons by the end of uh, 21. Uh, you have, uh, you know, global energy demand of 30% for gas by 2040. You have LNG currently growing seven times faster than pipeline gas. Um, and, you know, total consumption and the number of new LNG importers is set to, to, to multiply, we think, by the end of 2030. Uh, and, and a lot of this is, is actually explained by, by China. Uh, you know, China has now surpassed Korea and it's actually the second largest importer of uh, LNG. We've seen April numbers indicating a 6 million incremental LNG volume uh, year to date, which is close to 60% growth rate year over year, which I think is, is quite uh, unexpected given industry expectations of 20-30%. Um, I want to touch upon China initially. I mean, the, the extreme growth at rates that we're seeing now, do we see any chance of them, you know, trending downwards? And maybe what are the potential bottlenecks for that to happen? Maybe, Tony, I'll ask you first. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it's very difficult to make a prediction about China and uh, what the uh, year on year uh, uh, of growth will be. Um, but what we do know uh, is that uh, China had its first LNG terminal in 2008. Today they have 17 operable terminals and five under construction. Um, gas is only representing 6% of, of China's energy mix. So we believe that with a push for coal to gas uh, in China, in particular for power generation, is very important. Uh, the policy towards coal to gas switch will continue and therefore we will see um, strong growth in LNG imports in China. Exactly what that number will be is very difficult to predict. Right. Any other ones have a, have a comment on China? Paul, you're fixing a lot of ships to, out of the US to China. What are your expectations for, for imports in the future? Yeah, I think if, if you look at China, um, for many years it was the market that was going to come and I think there's a you know, sort of a mantra that we have is that you tend to underest uh, overestimate what's going to happen in two years and underestimate what's going to happen in seven years. And if I go back two years, we kept thinking China's coming, China's coming, there's, they have to sort out their pollution problems, they have to uh, swap from uh, coal to gas. And then finally it happened, and it took everybody by surprise, but really it shouldn't have done, 
but it did, and we were one of them. Um, I think that continues. I think we saw a 46% increase in LNG demand last year in China, another 60%, as you said, uh, ESPEN so far this year. I think uh, this is going to continue. Once you've made that change over from these coal-burning boilers to gas, you don't go back. Um, I think the pollution problems they've got there are real. I think they need to make this swap over. There was a point last year when President Xi came out of the five-year Congress and he said, I think it was in October, said, this winter we will have blue skies in Beijing. And when President Xi says something, it happens, and we had blue skies in Beijing because of the swapping from coal to gas. We're not going back. The rate of expansion is going to continue in China. I'm pretty confident about that. What about you, Christos, when you visited China? Do you see any potential bottlenecks you know, either on the regas side or on the pipeline system? I, I think very, very few people are worried about the China rate of growth at this moment. And this will maintain the consumption. On the other hand, the world population is getting uh, uh, bigger and bigger and bigger. And I believe this will uh, enhance the demand for LNG. I see two uh, dangers only. One is if we go back to nuclear. Unfortunately, Mr. Trump has not talked about this for the moment. And uh, if there is a serious problem with uh, shale gas. Maybe for you, Harry, I mean, with these numbers is, is very similar to what you saw on LPG back in 2016 for Chinese imports. And now the numbers, you know, growth rates are more in, in the tune of 8 to 10 percent. And we certainly saw there was some, some capacity restraints on, on the import side in China. Do you, do you think there's a read across from LPG to LNG? Um, there's not so much competition because uh, LPG is the first energy source that uh, developing nations use after they stop burning wood. Uh, you have still all around the world hundreds, maybe thousands of small towns and villages that these people burn wood to cook their food and uh, heat their homes. So for them, the next uh, step up in the evolutionary uh, process is to buy a gas canister like the ones we use for our barbecues so we can, they can cook their food and heat their homes. So um, LNG is a far, uh, far more advanced process. You need, you need uh, very expensive uh, terminals to load and discharge, whereas on the other side, on LPG is a far simpler uh, process, and that's why from burning wood you go to the gas canisters then you go to probably electricity, and then you go to natural gas, which is uh, one of the most advanced uh, and clean uh, energy sources. Um, for us, when you see uh, so much demand coming from all around the world, and don't forget that LPG is a necessity, meaning that these people need to cook and need to heat their homes. So if this gas canister costs, costs five cents or seven cents, these people still want to have to buy it, otherwise they won't be able to, to feed themselves. So we're quite optimistic for the future, and this general trend to go towards uh, cleaner energy obviously is a very big boost for both uh, LPG and LNG. Perfect. And Christos, maybe for you, last year the Chinese were instrumental in driving up the, the spot rates. You saw as much as 50% of the volumes coming through the spot market. What's your expectations for this winter? Well, I think we already see Chinese demand uh, building up early in the year. Um, we definitely are positive and bullish on the uh, 2018 winter. Uh, however, we do think that they have become a little bit smarter in their purchases. So you uh, will see an upward trajectory as you do in Q4. Um, I think you know the panel answered everything uh, prior to myself. Uh, the important part, I would say, in this industry that we are in is we are moving from uh, a less environmentally uh, friendly industry to a more environmentally friendly industry, both on the LPG and the LNG part of the business. And I think that's why this is an exciting um, business to be in uh, from an investor standpoint, at least. And then kind of sticking to the spot market, I mean, we've seen the spot rates move from 85,000 in January down to 40, and now they're picking up again. And just recently, we saw Chenier out fixing a handful of ships for you know, for period charters. Uh, is there a lot of interest now for period charters, you know, for the second half of this year? Maybe you, uh, Paul? Yeah, I mean, 
historically in shipping, in any market, what you tend to see is once there's uh, a perceived shortage of ships, that you'll see people, uh, the charters coming in for the term business, and that's exactly what we're seeing now. Um, people, I think, were taken by surprise uh, last winter at uh, just how quickly the market moved. Uh, I was talking to a trader recently who was saying, you know, we could have bought a cargo in Europe, we could have sold it into Asia, we could have made money on the arbitrage, we could not get a ship. And I think once people start to realize that actually shipping is a scarce commodity, then they move to put, the, uh, put that in place. Because the next time that shipping guy turns around to his trader and says, sorry, you can't do the deal, you can't make money because I haven't got a ship for you, it's probably the last time he's gonna have that conversation with his uh, trading guy. So I, we, we're already seeing it. We're seeing quite a few people in the market for multi-month deals. We're seeing people in the market for multi-year deals. Um, I think that's a trend we're gonna see continue as everybody is perceiving this tightness coming into the LNG market. And Tony, maybe the, you know, the cool pool is, I would say, quite successful since it's a startup. Uh, but you know, one thing is spot trades, another one is, is utilization. And certainly utilization was, was quite high this winter, but now it seems to be you know, trending downwards. Uh, what's the current utilization, you think, in, in the spot uh, pool? Well, it's, it's right that you know, it was a very tight market. And um, you know, in general, the market utilization was very high. And that was also reflected in the pool. Um, then it, um, uh, it softened, uh, and now it's on the way up again. Um, so we really believe that uh, second half of this year uh, is going to be really uh, strong. Uh, as Paul said, we have, um, you know, there are several charters out looking for medium term, and when I say medium term, I mean, you know, six to 18 months charters. Uh, you said a handful has been concluded. Uh, that is definitely uh, very true. Even more has been concluded. And uh, um, we, uh, we believe that uh, it will be a lot of activity um, that will improve the utilization going forward. We don't have an estimate on exactly what that number will be, but we really expect that second half of this year, on average, will be much better than the first half. Maybe for you, Stavos, I mean, uh, China is very important now for, uh, for the U.S. production. Uh, and certainly there's been some trade tensions uh, recently. Do you think there's a chance that China could look elsewhere for, for LNG needs in the future? I mean, um, it, it's, it's, it's a very good question that. I mean, when we look at all the production from, from Sabine Pass, um, in first quarter, more than 60% of it went to the Far East. Um, but when we look at from the Far Eastern side, you know, how much of their total imports came from the US. It's that not, that's not a very big number. That's between five and 7%. So definitely, uh, you know, China is now buying from, from the US because it means that they don't have a lot of other alternatives. They wouldn't be buying from that far away uh, if they had alternatives. Um, also coupled with that, you know, the, the U.S. gas in general is very good quality and very, you know, it's a very good use for the, uh, you know, for China and for the Far East. So um, I don't think we'll see um, a disruption in, uh, in the LNG trade uh, from the, uh, you know, from be between the U.S. and China. And also, I think it's important to mention that a lot of the buyers from the U.S. Um, are portfolio players that are not American companies, which onwards sell their cargoes to the Far East. Right. And I mean, we, we just saw Chinair taking FID on, on the Corpus Christi train three, and I, and I noted that they hadn't really sold as much of the gas as they used to in the past. It was more two thirds. I mean, what's kind of the read across of that in terms of the pricing of US cargoes? Do you, do you just think that it's so advantageous that it will be a margin to capture on, on essentially anything the plants can produce? Maybe you, for you, Paul? Um, yeah, I think what we're seeing is uh, a move towards a certain amount of flexibility in the amount of uh, onward sale, but you still actually need to have um, a fair amount of your production sold on to actually get the financing. And I think that therein lies the, the rub. If you look at the last couple of years, we haven't seen any FIDs because we haven't seen the long-term buyers there and people have not been able to put the financing in place. Um, I think 
looking at uh, Corpus Christi 3, I think they got about 75%, 80% of that uh, away and then said, okay, we'll take FID because one, we're confident that uh, we can sell the rest of it and two, we're also confident that there's a growing spot market. So I do think that you'll see um, FIDs taken with uh, less of the product sold than in the past. I don't think you need 100%. Um, and I think that's going to be a, make it for an interesting market um, on the more short-term side. Thank you. And you know, higher oil prices, at least in the past, has been very positive for, for LNG because a lot of cargoes are essentially FOB slopes. Um, maybe Stavos, do you think there at some point will be you know, demand destructive to have very high gas prices? Will it be you know, competitive with, with coal and renewables? I think uh, prices are linked to the capacity that will come online in the next uh, uh, few years. Uh, oil prices may come up and this will help LNG prices to go up, but prices are also linked with the capacity that will come in line uh, basically from Australia and Ka the Qataris are also saying they will increase capacity in the next few years. So I don't expect that we will see uh, very high LNG prices uh, and uh, I believe that uh, a lot of people are now negotiating LNG prices not on the basis of the crude oil prices minus uh, a certain percentage. They do individual uh, uh, contracts. Thank you. Maybe last question on the, on the demand side. I mean, there's certainly a lot of growth in, in some of these uh, countries, but there's also some, some tapering off in some of the other traditional importers as, as Japan. Maybe for you, Christos, I mean, do you think the Japanese has, has too much LNG in the, in the years to come? Well, I think that's what the market has been saying until today. What we saw is basically if you have a movement upwards in the pricing of JKM, which is the price that the gas is sold in Asia, that means that demand is pretty much outstripping supply. And I think it's clear from JKM's movement over the last year that that has moved in the right direction for us. So our view is that the incremental capacity that may be uh, um, or less from Japan will be absorbed from markets such as China and India uh, in the Far East. Of course, you have the Middle East be being the shoulder and incremental demand. So we are confident that that demand is going to pull, uh, whether it goes to Japan or elsewhere. All right. And let's uh, maybe speak a bit about kind of the, the vessel deficit that's been, uh, I think, a consensus to you now for, for a couple of years. And Paul, I know you laid out in the capital market today that you see 35 to maybe 62 vessels being, you know, the market short by the end of 2022. But there's certainly been a lot of orders so far this year. So I wanted to start with, you know, get your thinking on, are you, are you surprised that we're seeing 20 orders or so, so far this year? Christos or Paul? Well, I, I was a few of those orders, so maybe Paul should be surprised. <laughs> but he should answer that question. Um, no, I wasn't surprised. Cause we, we sort of showed a lot what we thought was over sort of a medium term, the amount of ships that were needed, but also over the short term and the build out of all the projects that have already taken FID. And you're somewhere between 20 and 40 ships short, depending where the, pro where the product goes. If it goes from the US Gulf to the Far East, then you need more ships, and that's certainly what we've been seeing. Those projects are building out uh, through 2020 and into 2021. If you don't order the ships now, those ships won't be ready. So I think the market was reacting to the signals that actually we needed some ships uh, for the projects that have already taken FID and are definitely going to be um, uh, producing products. So I wasn't surprised to see uh, so many. I was a little surprised to see people taking uh, ships without sort of firm contracts against them. Um, I think there's enough uh, around that we will see uh, more demand from people who haven't uh, placed their shipping needs. Uh, but no, I think it's, um, it, it's a healthy scene uh, at the moment. We still have uh, a deficit of ships that we need for the new production coming on stream. Right. Maybe, Christos, you haven't been active in, in a while, and then you, you ordered, I think, three ships so far in, in 18. What's the, what's the thinking behind those? Well, we've built a business since 2011, so we plan to grow along with our customers and as they have the requirements. So I would say we're not necessarily speculators, although we will take risk uh, on, a, on, a spec, on a spot basis. 
So our thinking behind that is we think that we will comfortably put these ships onto term business. And I would say that, you know, I would caution uh, against people ordering uh, LNG ships that are not already in the space because I do think that there are high, high barriers to entry in operations and in technical management that people uh, don't uh, necessarily calculate or can miscalculate. And you know, we, we saw this in the last ordering cycle where we ordered some speculative ships and we found it increasingly difficult to be able to be approved by a lot of these majors. Because I think what's a little bit different in this trade versus other traditional commodity trades is the fact that the energy is basically lights on or lights off in a lot of these countries. And what that basically means is that the customers want to trust the operations and the technical management of those ship owners to be able to deliver that gas. So it's price, I would say it's demand inelastic, which, which, which is important um, uh, from, from, from our side. So I would say we're excited about the space and we think it's going to be growing. We want to be a part of it as, as uh, you know, the, the other players on, on, on this panel are, and Harry. Right. But I mean, the Korean yards are still telling us that they will see 40, 50 orders in, in 2018. So you need another 20, 30. I mean, Tony, who is going to do the ordering now, you think? Or Stavros, you have a comment? Uh, yes, just to remind everybody that the average speed of the fleet today is nothing close to 19 and a half knots uh, for which the, ship, uh, the ships have been designed for. The average speed for our ships, the trading ships, not the project ships, uh, for, for last year was only 15.3 knots. So there is some, uh, let's say, capacity hidden uh, in an increase of speed of the existing fleet. Maybe I want to start, uh, continue with you, Starvos. I mean, you have six LNGs under construction. You have one FSU. In the past, Marin, Marin gas has been typically been relying on, on long-term contracts on those assets. Is that still the, the thinking? We have eight ships uh, on order, not six, and one FSRU. Sorry. Uh, out of the eight ships, five are uh, uh, fixed long-term. Uh, our policy uh, has... Um, always been to have some uh, ships ordered on speculation. And we, as, as I said, we have three ships uh, on order on speculation at this moment. OK. And Tony, maybe to pick up again on, on the, the remaining ordering, who do you think are the, the ones to order now? And well, we haven't ordered. <laughs> so um, it's difficult to say. Um, I think we'll see a blend of speculative orders and, uh, and against fixed contracts. So we would. You know, from, from our point of view, um, it's, it's quite difficult because, you know, LNG is recovering. Um, so uh, if you, I mean, the, uh, let's say the orders that we have seen against fixed contracts, the economics in it, as, you know, at least what we've heard, are not that great. Um, and the periods are not that long. Uh, so if you fix at marginal rates for five to seven years, well, then you have a lot of residual risk. So then the question is, where is technology today versus that technology risk? And in Dynagas, we're not entirely comfortable with that. We think that we have seen a tremendous change in technology during the last 10 years, and it hasn't stopped. It's still going on. Um, the ship that you order today is not necessarily the ship that you'll order two years from now. So um, until the market improves in terms of um, period and uh, income on those vessels. Um, you know, we, we are not there to, uh, to order speculative right now. We, you know, we'd rather wait to see what happens with technology until it's more mature. And uh, unfortunately, the charter rates are just too poor to justify a five to seven year fixed deal. Right, and maybe speaking on technology, I, I think the industry still seems a bit divided in terms of XTF versus Megi. I mean, what's the experience so far with these vessels? Has there been, you know, one better than the other one? Or maybe for you, Paul? Um, I can't really uh, comment on Meggy because we haven't uh, used the uh, Meggy engines. We have three XDF vessels which have delivered to us this year and um, all performing very well, uh, both from a technical point of view and from the consumption point of view. So. We're really pleased with the decision we made uh, to take Meggy, uh, to take XTF engines. Just as an aside, I hope uh, both sets of engines work because the worst thing that happened, I think, for the LNG shipping industry was we had one manufacturer really manufacturing the TFDE engines. And, and when you have a, 
uh, a monopoly. It's never good for an industry. So I ha we haven't used it, uh, Megis. Um, I, I know that uh, Stavros has, so maybe you've got some comments on that. But so far, we're very pleased with uh, the performance of the XDF engines. Stavros, maybe you have, uh, can share some opinions on the, on the Megis you have? Uh, we don't have a Megi vessel delivered uh, so far. Our original delivery was for two years ago but we managed to place into the LNG uh, slots VLCC vessels. So our first delivery is 1st of July. We did have the gas trials of uh, the first vessel. Uh, it went okay. Our specification is not the standard MEGI specification be because we have two high pressure compressors instead of one and we have a full reliquification system instead of a partial one. Uh, so far for the gas trials everything went okay. For me, the biggest advantage of the MEGI engine is uh, the better performance, especially in the liquid mode. Uh, and uh, personally, I consider MIN uh, a, a, a more reliable engine. Uh, the biggest disadvantage of MEGI is the complex uh, gas supply system and the high pressure of 300 bar. Uh, I will agree with Paul that it is nice to have uh, different technologies uh, to compare and to be able to, 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 to reach a solution in the next few years. I don't expect, uh, although we have uh, a, a very rapid uh, technology development in the LNG market, within 12, 13 years we went from steam to uh, diesel electric and from diesel electric to slow speed MEGI or XTF, we have seen developments in the cargo containment system, everything is moving there, and we have seen developments in the reliquification uh, sector. Uh, it's a lot of technological uh, developments in a, in, in a short space of time. Christos, when you look at the, the Nubel quotes now, I mean, they're up, but they're not up in the same magnitude that maybe you see on the VLCCs and, and the tankers and containers. Why, why, why do you think that is? Are you talking about the market reports, uh, the physical market, or the capital markets reports? Uh, talking about the new bills that are being ordered, I mean, essentially at 185, and maybe, you know, at the end of last year, you were shaving off 10 million. But, you know, in percentage terms, it's still below what we've seen on some of the other segments. Sure. I mean, we do expect the yard prices to increase over time. The reasoning behind uh, no increase to date, um, I do not know. You have to ask the, uh, the yards. Uh, however, I would say that the direction on the yard prices should, we, should be upwards um, and, you know, it should follow the, the market direction. Until now, the LNG market has not proved to live up to expectations because expectations were very high. So I think, you know, assuming that you see a bump on the physical side of the business, which would translate into higher rates, you should see the uh, value of the new buildings translate uh, and correlate to that as well. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. You know, and lead time for LNGs has typically been 30 months and, and more. Um, how many vessels more do you think we can have for 2020 deliveries? Maybe you, Tony? How many more orders? How many uh, that can be delivered in, in 2020 if they're ordered now? Oh, um, in 2020, I guess if you order today, you can get something on the very back end of 2020. So, I don't know, um, 15 vessels? No, 10? I'm, okay. it's, you know, I think we have to ask the yards about that. And I said, we, you know, we're holding off for now. So, uh, I think, you know, Paul and Christos and the others are the best to answer that. Okay, perfect. And we have four minutes left. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that have a questions for our um, uh, panels? No, sure. Uh, maybe as a last topic, you know, the, the FSU market, um, we pinned as kind of the most interesting shipping market back in 2016, and certainly there's been a big disappointment so far. Uh, you've seen a lot of, of orders, you've seen, you know, projects being delayed, uh, you've seen pressure on rates on, on, on both new builds and, and second hand tonnage. I mean, is this a market one should uh, really enter now? Maybe you, Stavros? Okay. The advantage that I see in the, in the LNG market is that it is uh, most of the times long term, it's positive cash flow, but uh, I feel that uh, if you 
take advantage in, of the spot market in other trades, you can make a better return on money for a short period, maybe. Maybe for you, Paul, how's your progress on, on uh, FSU businesses? Yeah, I mean, if you look at FSIU, I think um, there's a short-term overhang of ships, without a doubt. Uh, we Probably the projects haven't happened as quickly as people expected, and also some ships were ordered, pro perhaps prematurely, against projects which were then cancelled. However, if you believe in the thesis that uh, gas is cheap, abundant, clean energy source that lots of countries want to get access to, then I think you have to believe in the FSRU market because it's the quickest and the most cost-effective way to get gas into a market. So I think the, at present you'll probably see uh, 12, probably 24 months uh, for the overhang of tonnage to work its way through. But I think in, long term, in a long-term basis, we're pretty confident that FSRUs are going to play a major part in the gas industry and I think we'll give uh, decent returns. Maybe for you, Christos, do you have a couple of TFCs and also, uh, you know, Nubus? Are you considering converting or, or building them to, to FSRUs? I think the other panelists are better suited to answer these FSRU questions. We're focused on LNG, so right. shipping. Maybe you, Tony? Yeah, we have two FSRUs on order. Um, so we believe very much in that market and we're pretty impressed what has happened, actually, because we've seen a market that has gone from being extremely long-term and unique to being in a, a market where you can charter in units for seasonal uh, need. Um, so, you, you know, obviously that's, the, that's very interesting. Um, we have um, carefully made a design to uh, accommodate exactly this change in the industry. Uh, so, for example, our vessels are tailor-made for a dual purpose, so they can be uh, used as, as uh, efficient LNG carriers without any real handicap. So they twin skeg with 19 and a half knots, and they're extremely versatile on the regas side as well. So they're open loop and closed loop and combined loop, etc. So we feel that the market is going in a direction where, yes, there is less of this long term. Uh, permanent installations uh, for FSO use, uh, so it's important that you try to incorporate that uh, in the ship's design. All right. Maybe follow a question for you, Paul. I mean, you're spending significant capital for some of the TS TFTs to build uh, the relay faction plants. Can you kind of walk us through the, the economics on, on those? Uh, I've got 21 seconds, so I won't take you through the uh, economics as such, but what I will say is it's all about unit freight costs. Uh, what uh, customers want is to have very safe, very reliable shipping at a low unit freight cost. Putting on the real liquefaction uh, on the existing TFDEs with the uh, boil-offs that we have makes those ships much more attractive in terms of the unit freight cost for the customer. Uh, when you look at that on a sort of return on investment payback period, then putting those uh, real liquefaction plants on makes sense for those ships. Perfect. Without that, I'll take the panelists for further attendance. Thank you.